pioneer Gothic. The building was built in 1847. So if my arithmetic is correct, it is now 172 years old. Old, say the spirits of the ancients? No. Long before you came, we were here. The indigenous people were here. And so tonight, we, we recognize and acknowledge that we are gathered together here on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and are within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Thank you, Doug. You know, it's also the tradition of our First Nations people when they gather right away is to um, give a prayer of thanksgiving. And so it is in the spirit of thanksgiving and of gratitude that I welcome you here this evening. And I know we all have different reasons for which we may be um, experiencing gratitude at any time, but for this evening, I invite you to um, hold a present for yourself, a sense of gratitude for wisdom, for wisdom shared. For we know that wisdom's dearest sibling is justice. And so in that, in that space, I invite us to, to first listen. And then there will be a time when we can enter into some dialogue for the wisdom here this evening does not reside in one person alone. Our, our dear guest speaker, um, I'm sure, would acknowledge the wisdom in all of us present, for we were at least wise enough to come out here this evening. <laughs> and so I invite us um, later on this evening to engage in a, a Q&A, uh, a conversation. But I ask that um, when we do that, we do that in such a way that we remember the gratitude of wisdom and that we honor one another respectfully. Um, Gratitude for wisdom will go beyond this um, this evening. There is a gentleman with a, a little sticker on his shirt that says Usher. It's very official. Um, and he's gathering email addresses. So if you'd like to sign up to uh, continue to gather um, and be a part of the sharing of wisdom, then make sure you um, speak with this gentleman or at least sign up your name. And I want to um, acknowledge for you those who have um, recognized the wisdom of our speaker this evening. And it is because of that recognition of his wisdom that um, they have invited him here. And so I'm, I'm now going to give you a list of, of sponsors. The Political Science Department at McMaster. The Labor Studies Department at McMaster. The Hamilton Chapter of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Democracy Probe International, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, Independent Jewish Voices, Jewish Liberation Theology Institute, Palestinian Association of Hamilton, Solidarity with Palestinian Human Rights, McMaster, the Social Justice Committee of, of um, uh, the United Church of Canada, the McMaster Muslims for Peace and Justice, the McMaster Womanists, and Hamilton District Labor Council. Um, and OPIRG McMaster um, is the last sponsor. So if any of you want any further information um, about any of those organizations, then do make sure that your, your um, uh, address is up on the sign-up sheet. So without further ado now, I would like to invite Tom Atherton, who is representing the uh, um, Hamilton and District Labor Council to come up and to introduce our distinguished guests. So good evening, uh, comrades and friends. It is my privilege this evening uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker. Uh, before I summarize Professor Link's impressive background, 
uh, I'd like to say a few things by way of preface. First, as was mentioned, I am here represent, I am a representative of the Hamilton and District Labor Council, an umbrella group comprised of tens of thousands of workers in this city who are, through their unions, affiliated to the 3.3 million member Canadian Labor Congress. Our task is to advance the economic and social welfare of workers and implement the policies and campaigns of the CLC and the Ontario Federation of Labour at the local level. I'm sorry, I think he's in my place here. Use your finger. The Labour Council Constitution commits us to promoting the cause of peace and freedom in the world and protecting and strengthening democracy and human rights. The CLC and the Labour Council have a long-standing policy, reaffirmed in 2017, of supporting a peace-building process between Palestine and Israel that leads to two sovereign states within safe borders and free from occupation. We support Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. We have urged the Government of Canada to support recognition of the State of Palestine. And we acknowledge that economic actions are a legitimate form of protest. But for all that, somewhat shamefully, our Labour Council has not been vocal or visible in our support, rarely speaking, even in a minor capacity, like at an event just like this to see me. So why is this lecture different? Why would we lend our name to it and accept a role in the program? The answer, my friends, is the speaker. The invitation to participate that our executive council had in front of them uh, did not include any biographical information on the speaker. And suddenly one of our members recalled that there is a labor arbitrator named Michael Lane. Surely this is not the same person, he asked. Uh, a Google search confirmed that this Michael Link is indeed that Michael Link. And that, for all intents and purposes, sealed our decision to support this talk. For though I'm sure not every worker or union who appeared before him was happy with the result, those of us here and who have dealt with him or knew of his work respected his integrity and judgment we concluded that we should listen to what he has to say. Professor Link is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at Western University in London, where he has taught courses in labor, human rights, disability, constitutional, and administrative law. He was born in Halifax and earned degrees from Dalhousie University and Queen's University. Prior to joining the academy, Professor Link was a practicing labor lawyer. And as mentioned earlier, he is a labor arbitrator and serves as vice chair with the Ontario Grievance Settlement Board. He has co-authored or co-edited five, at least that was my count, uh, significant publications on labor law and human rights, including International Law in the Middle East Conflict, a rights-based approach, published by Rutledge in 2011. In March 2016, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Professor Link as the seventh special rapporteur for the human rights situation in the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967. Some of Professor Link's critics point to the statement made by the Canadian government at the time of his appointment that he doesn't speak for Canada. He doesn't speak for the Canadian government, it's true. But that is not his job. He is an independent reporter. And we look forward to hearing some insightful and independent reflections from him this evening. So please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Lane. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, particularly on such a cold night. Um, I was going to go uh, tell you for a few minutes about my work as a, uh, uh, as a labor lawyer and how thrilled I have to be introduced by somebody coming from a district in labor council because I spent <clears throat> approximately a dozen years working either in private practice on behalf of unions and employees 
for working directly on staff with about half a dozen different unions. I often thought of myself as being a union gypsy. Uh, and it was, I must say, many of the same things that drove me to want to become a labor lawyer uh, uh, initially, young in my life, for the same reasons that it took me to uh, uh, have an interest in international affairs in general. I grew up in a period of time where the large internet, largest international struggle was over the end of apartheid in South Africa. And I lived in East Africa, in Tanzania, as a 20 something on a scholarship to study economics. And I was there at the time of the uprising in 1976 uh, in South Africa uh, and watched from afar. There are many people at the university where I taught, um, uh, where I taught, where I studied at uh, Dar es Salaam, um, who were uh, either part of the ANC in those days, because the ANC, the African National Congress of South Africa, had its international headquarters uh, in Tanzania at that time. So it was through that that I wanted to become interested in issues in the, in the Middle East as well. And I like to think the two of them are tightly entwined. I often tell people that uh, one of the key legal features of, the, uh, of labor law is a duty to bargain in good faith. And I often use that as saying, is there, a, is there a duty to bargain in good faith and is good faith being applied when we look at the Middle East? And you make up your mind um, as I uh, give my lecture tonight. Um, what I want to do tonight is uh, talk about a couple of things. First of all, I want to tell you what, what is, is the work that I want to do in this special rapporteur. I then want to talk for a few minutes, um, and probably not nearly enough given the disaster that is going on there with respect to Gaza. And then I want to talk to you about the, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem in terms of settlements. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, I guess, what international law says about the settlements. And then I'm going to conclude with a couple of remarks with respect to how durable is this, uh, this occupation. And then I'm more than happy to have, uh, have questions asked uh, about me with respect to either my work or my views with respect to this. Um, so to begin, um, and if I can ask you to move <coughs> slide, uh, go to the next one. Uh, as well. So the first slide you just saw very briefly there was the Palais des Nations in, uh, in Geneva, which is the old headquarters for the, uh, for the League of Nations. Uh, and is where, if you like, is, is the United Nations second headquarters after New York. And as part of that complex, it's a very large complex in Geneva, is the Human Rights uh, Council, which you see under this amazing ceiling um, that was uh, created about 15 years ago. Um, I am a creature of the uh, Human Rights Council. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, the, what was then the Human Rights uh, Commission um, began to create a section of its work called Special Procedures. And these Special Procedures were the appointment initially of <coughs> temporary Special Rapporteurs or independent human rights experts, and later on became a more formalized uh, part of the work, and, and indeed a, a critical part of the work. So today, there are roughly, in the ballpark of 55 or 54 special rapporteurs, um, human rights experts chosen from all around the world. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are, um, are university professors who have developed a particular lifetime academic interest in a particular area, and who also have skills, I guess, of public speaking, of public advocacy, and uh, the ability to be able to write for broad audiences in addition to be able to write for different scholars. So of the 55 or 56, about 44 of them or so, approximately, are special rapporteurs with a thematic uh, mandate. The special rapporteur on torture, the special rapporteur on food, the special rapporteur on housing rights. Um, and the remaining 12 or so uh, the special rapporteurs, including myself, have geographic or country mandates. The special rapporteur for human rights in North Korea in Cambodia, in Sudan, and in my case, a uh, special rapporteur with respect to human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories. They appointed the first special rapporteur in Palestine in 1993. Um, I'm the seventh, as was mentioned in the introduction. Um, I, I should tell you, which I forgot to mention in the afternoon lecture, I am not allowed by the Israeli government to be able to go to Israel or the occupied territories. Um, my uh, I don't think personally, neither of my two predecessors 
immediate predecessors. Um, let's see, the last one was Winasono, who was a, uh, an Indonesian diplomat, and before him, Richard Falk, a name some of you may know, who was an eminent uh, scholar of international law in the United States. Um, they both were banned from, by Israel from being able to go to the occupied Palestinian territory. And indeed, my immediate predecessor, Winasono, was uh, resigned after roughly, uh, roughly two years in the position, precisely because he was told he would be allowed to go to the occupied territories, and he wasn't, and he said, Israel is obstructing my work. So plan A would be to be able to go there. Um, if I don't have a plan A, then my plan B is not so bad. Um, there is the magic of Skype uh, or any of the other uh, social media networks to be able to talk on a regular basis with Palestinian, Israeli, and human rights and international human rights organizations uh, about current developments. All of these organizations that do work on the occupation produce top drawer research and advocacy. Uh, very reliable, very professional work, and I rely upon their work a great deal for the reports that I wind up doing. So what is the work that I wind up doing? I issue uh, two reports a year, once one in March to the Human Rights Council in Geneva, and one in October to the General Assembly of the United Nations. And in writing these reports, uh, and in fact, in the entire course of my work, I have a great deal of freedom. Uh, uh, a little bit like an academic scholar, I guess. I get to choose what, what uh, within my mandate, what topics I'm going to write about, what I'm going to say, and how I'm going to wind up saying it. Um, the United Nations is, has a tendency towards bureaucracy, and it probably is no, uh, no secret to you. My reports cannot be longer than 10,700 words. And usually, I come up with about 15,000 words, and like any good academic, I'm crying with every word that falls on the editing floor with respect to this. My reports are public. Um, you can find them uh, if you just Google my name, Michael Link, United Nations Special Rapporteur, and eventually after all the bad press that I'm getting, you'll eventually find my, uh, the, uh, the link, no pun, to the, uh, uh, to these, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, website that I have, or that's set up for me, that includes all of my recent statements as well as my my five reports that I've issued to date. Uh, I'm in the process now of writing my sixth report to be delivered in two months' time in Geneva. And usually in the, in the spring, or the, I write on social and economic themes. So I'm going to be delivering a report on the Palestinian territories with respect to the right to water, uh, the right to natural resources, uh, the right to agriculture, and to a clean, uh, clean environment. And in the fall of 2019, I'm going to be delivering my next report, my seventh report, to the UN General Assembly on the theme of third party responsibilities. What is the responsibility of the international community to bringing an end to the 51 year old and counting, by that time 52 year old uh, occupation and achieving uh, some high form of justice and peace and uh, and durable security for all of the 13 million people or so that live between the Mediterranean um, and, the, uh, and the Jordan River. Um, my reports, I try to make them as factual and as uh, based, seen through the prism of, uh, of international law. Um, and I would invite you to, uh, to go look at them. If you have trouble, you can, you can easily write me. I, I can be found easily through the website, the uh, University of Western Ontario. Um, and I'd be happy to make a direct send, send you directly by both my, my, uh, the link to my page and to the reports that, uh, that I wind up doing. Um, another part, important part of the work that I do is making regular statements, public and sometimes confidential, uh, both public and confidential, with respect to uh, what is going on with respect to human rights. And it's a lot to say. I issued my most recent re uh, statement yesterday morning uh, issued out of Geneva with respect to the intensification of the settlement process that's going on in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and that's a theme that I'll be talking to you about tonight. I talked about the large upstart in construction tenders that are being issued for new settlement units throughout the, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. I talked about the shooting of an unarmed uh, Palestinian father of four in a small village in the northern part of the West Bank shot by settlers in the presence of the Israeli army 
Um, the other day were defending their village after the settlers, armed settlers, had, uh, had come in. Uh, my statement also noted uh, the announcement of a new settlement activity in Bethlehem and outside of uh, Ramallah as well. Um, these are all worrying concerns. If, if I, um, I realize I could probably be issuing a statement every two to three days with respect to what's going on there, I try to save my gunpowder for something that is big and that will catch the, um, the eye, I guess, of both international diplomats, national uh, politicians and foreign ministries, as well as civil society and, uh, and NGOs who work on this particular, uh, work on this particular issue. Um, so this is the room actually where I make my report uh, once, once uh, a year in March. Uh, let me just give you a two minute summary for those of you who may not be that familiar with, uh, with, the, with the conflict or with the struggle. Um, 1917 is important for the issuance of the Belfort Declaration by Britain in November the 2nd of, uh, of 1917. Um, the, um, at that time when Britain um, wrote to the European Zionist movement um, uh, saying that they supported the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the population was roughly, of uh, Palestine of around 650,000 people, was roughly 93% Palestinian Arab, uh, both um, Muslim and, uh, and Christian. There had been a small, continuous Jewish uh, presence ever since antiquity, uh, mostly based in, uh, in Jerusalem through that period of time. Leading up to 1948, which was um, a year after the UN had declared a partition of Mandate Palestine as Britain was beginning to leave its 30-year-old hold uh, on, uh, on, pa on Palestine, that led to the 1948 war. Um, the Jewish state expanded its boundaries from the assigned 56% from the partition plan to 78% and it also created roughly 740,000 Palestinian refugees. Lead on then the 1967 war, um, which was a war um, between Israel, and Egypt, Syria, uh, and Jordan. The result of that war was that uh, Israel had conquered all, or bringing ter a lot of territory around it, including the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, and, and as well as the Gaza Strip, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, um, and the Golan Heights from, uh, from Syria. Uh, and this is the beginning of the occupation of the Palestinian uh, territories. We then go to the, to the uh, from the Six Day War, 1967, to Oslo. Oslo, 1993, is when the very famous handshake took place between Yasser Arafat and uh, Yitzhak Rabin on the lawn of the, uh, of the White House, uh, and setting up the so-called Oslo process, which, uh, which had said it was going to lead to a five-year staged plan where all of the final uh, issues um, outstanding between the Israelis and the Palestinians would be negotiated. It didn't promise explicitly a Palestinian state, but that would, would have been the assumption of virtually everybody who was viewing and knowledgeable with what was going on. And there were a series of treaties of, of, uh, and declarations that were signed following Oslo 1. And this is the process that we're in today um, a process that's now moribund after 25 plus years. Um, and we are probably never further away from achieving a just and sustainable peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians than we are now. Um, and I will end off my, my talk tonight by talking about, I guess, my observations with respect to the entrenching occupation. Okay. So here's a map of the, um, of the West Bank. Um, and what is important here is looking at the color scheme. The color scheme of the West Bank, all that area in gray, which is about 60% of the West Bank, is so-called Area C. That is under the exclusive security and civil control of, uh, of Israel. It's in the gray area which is where the 420,000 or so Israeli settlers living in about 230 Israeli settlements are throughout that period, uh, throughout that area. And the orange areas are the so-called areas A and B, which are area A is under the, under the supposed exclusive security and civil control of the Palestinian Authority. Area B is under the shared 
security um, of the Israeli army and the Palestinian Authority. In reality, um, if the Israeli army wants to go into Area B or indeed go into the highly populated cities, Palestinian cities in Area A, they either go in with the permission of the Palestinian Authority or without the permission of the Palestinian Authority. So um, the occupation continues throughout the entire 100% of, um, of that area. Um, I'll be mentioning Area C in a couple of occasions later on, so I just want to keep, you, keep that map in your mind with respect to this, because this is the area, if there's going to be annexation, and we are drifting closer and closer towards a formal Israeli annexation of the West Bank, uh, it would be either they would annex the entire uh, territory, or they would certainly annex most, if not all, of Area C, the area in gray. So what does this leave the Palestinians? You get a, a bit of a sense from the orange how chopped up the uh, areas under nominal Palestinian control are. And this is, in fact, a, a more interesting map. This is the so-called Palestinian ar archipelago of areas A and B. Um, this is 165 fragmented islands of the Palestinian territory that, that the Palestinian Authority nominally controls. Um, and there's virtually no ability to be able to move outside of a fairly confined area without going through Israeli checkpoints or trying to skirt the, uh, the separation wall. Um, and I always remember the statement made by James Wolfenson, who, is the, who was the former head executive director of the World Bank, um, and who later became the first, I think the first appointee of the Quartet, the United States, the European Union, the United Nations, and the Russian Federation, uh, their Middle East peace envoy, uh, who said, there is no such thing as a sustainable economy unless you have freedom of movement of people and goods. And when you look at that, you realize uh, what a desperate shape the West Bank economy is if the ability to be able to manufacture something in the south, in Hebron, can't be shipped with any certainty or security to go to Ramallah, or to Nablus, or Janine, because of the number of checkpoints you have to go through in order to be able to get your, your people and your goods to where your market would wind up being. And this, I, I show this because I've not been able to find a better map um, as I said, there's roughly 230 Palestinian settlements, sorry, Israeli settlements uh, in the West Bank. There are another um, dozen settlements uh, in, uh, in East Jerusalem. Um, and they are, would be almost all throughout the areas of where Area C would wind up being. So you have a, in a total of somewhere between 630 to 640,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank in East Jerusalem. Um, these settlements, every single one of them, and I'll explain this more in a few minutes, would be illegal um, under international law. And I'll explain that. Go ahead. This is Gaza. And I want to spend and stop to spend a few minutes because not enough, I think, gets said about Gaza, either in meetings like this or in the broader press. So this tiny area here, um, with Israel surrounded by Israel for the most part, Egypt is on the, uh, the southern border, and there's the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there are two million Palestinians, of around 70 to 75 percent of them would be refugees, or descendants of refugees, um, from villages and farms in the surrounding area who were expelled from Israel, fled from Israel in 1948. Um, there's very little to say that's happy about, uh, about Gaza. In 2017, in, I think July or August of 2017, the United Nations country team, which is, a, I guess, the amalgamation of all of the different UN agencies that are based in Jerusalem and the occupied territories, issued a comprehensive report on, uh, on the situation in Gaza. And it was a follow-up. It was a sequel to a damaging and deeply Looming report they issued initially in, in 2012. The 2012 report was entitled Gaza um, <clears throat> Will It Be Sustainable? Uh, Will It Survive Until 2020? And the 2017 report said it's on the precipice now. Um, and basically, what it was saying 
was that the living conditions and the economic conditions were collapsing in Gaza to the point where the idea of it not reaching sustainability by 2020 was perhaps optimistic. And in fact, when I take you through some of the recent statistics on Gaza, we may have reached that point of unlivability right now. Um, former UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon visited Gaza in the summer of 2016, in his last year as Secretary General. And he said, and I'm quoting, the closure of Gaza suffocates its people, stifles its economy, and impedes construction of a result, reconstruction of efforts. It is a collective punishment for which there must be accountability. And a year later, his successor, Antonio Guterres, uh, as Secretary General, said, and I'm quoting, the closures imposed by Gaza, by Israel, are contrary to international law, and they amount to collective punishment, and collective punishment um, is forbidden by Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, what are the living conditions in Gaza? Up until several months ago, the two million Gazans, and if, unless you had, were of the tiny elite that could afford diesel fuel and could run a generator, most Gazans, probably, I'm, I'm probably estimating around 80 to 85 percent of Gazans, lived on three to six hours of power a day through rolling blackouts. Because of money now coming from Qatar, that is now up to somewhere between 10 to 12 to 13 hours of, uh, of electricity a day. You and I never have to ask and wonder um, about where electricity is coming from. We take our power for granted. We take for granted our stove will work. Our refrigerator will run. Our computers will wind up running. We'll have lights on when we want them. We can turn lights off when we don't need them. We'll have power to be able to generate to power our toilets or our telephones. Um, and yet, this is not the case uh, with respect to Gaza. Um, this, this power surge, if you like, the fact of now having somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 um, uh, hours a day of electricity or power, will last only so long as the money keeps coming uh, from Qatar. There's no guarantee it'll have uh, any lengthy success. What this means then, if there's a lack of electricity, is that among other things, there's no electricity, there's no power to be able to adequately treat the sewage that is generated every day in Gaza. So something in the range between 100 to 110 million liters of raw or partly treated sewage goes into the Mediterranean daily because the lack of electricity to wind up running the treatment plants plus the lack of spare parts. Um, the World Bank has said that this, this uh, untreated sewage going into the Mediterranean creates, I'm quoting, a major public health threat. Uh, it means that the, uh, the waters all around Gaza, and indeed, those waters don't stay still. They go off into uh, Israel as well, and wind up being deeply polluted. It ruins, uh, uh, ruins the fishery, and it means water can't be, it's difficult to use water for the, uh, the new desalination plant that's being built. Um, and that turns the next issue uh, with respect to this, uh, livability in Gaza. It has to do with uh, drinking water. Presently, 97% of groundwater is now unfit for human consumption. The, the only wa uh, water source for Gaza comes from the coastal aquifer. That coastal aquifer is now almost entirely contaminated either with untreated sewage or with seawater that's coming in. And within a year or so, they expect that the entire coastal aquifer will be unfit for, uh, for human consumption. Uh, so th this means you have to wind up rationing water. Half of the population of Gaza has access to water for eight hours every four days. And another 30% receives water for eight hours every three days. The truck water that comes in that people have to buy is about 15 to 20 times more expensive than network uh, water. Unemployment. The World Bank estimates that the, as a geographic unit, the unemployment rate in Gaza is the highest of any of the countries or economic units that it winds up measuring. It was 44% in 2017. It's now, most recently, in the last figure we saw over in the fall of 2018, was at 54%, including well over 70% for Gazans under the age of 30. And keep that in mind that Gazans Young Gazans are relatively well-educated. 
Um, and so you have, you're, you're continually educating people to go into the gas and labor market with no money for liquidity to generate and kickstart an economy, no jobs, and uh, enforced idleness with respect to this. The World Bank had said um, they issued two reports a year with respect to the economic conditions in the OPT. Uh, in March of 2018, the World Bank had said that this growing financial liquidity crisis, uh, quote, has led, and I'm quoting here, has led to a rapid collapse in social economic conditions. Around a quarter of Gazans have seen their incomes drop significantly, placing, placing Gaza at a crucial juncture. Gaza is virtually the only economic unit in the world which has seen its GDP contract over the past uh, six years. Uh, since 1994, real per capita incomes in Gaza have fallen by a third. Uh, manufacturing dropped uh, over 25 years from 16% of GDP to 8% today. Um, in, as a point of comparison, in 1994, the economies were virtually the same size in, uh, per, in measured by per capita uh, income uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the West Bank was about 8% higher than Gaza was in 1994. In 2017, uh, the, the per capita income in the West Bank was 137% higher than it was in Gaza. Entirely slipping behind. Um, I'll point out to you that this is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily the responsibility of, uh, of Israel. Israel controls who goes, comes in and goes out of Gaza. Um, you cannot leave Gaza unless you have uh, as ready uh, permission. It, Israel controls the land border um, and in conjunction with, with Egypt, it ensures that the Egyptian border remains largely closed. It can, controls the entire airspace over Gaza. It controls the fishing zone uh, off, the, uh, off the sea. The former head of Israel's Mossad, Tamer Pardu, said uh, last year, I'm quoting, Israel is responsible for the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and this is the place with the biggest problem in the world today. I don't think it is the biggest problem in the world today, but certainly it's one of the most serious ones with respect to this. 80% um, of the population in Gaza, according to the United Nations, receives some form of social assistance. Um, what the World Bank says, what is needed to be able to uh, control this or to, be, to turn issues around in Gaza, um, this country report that I said, it says it's essential that the people of Gaza are enabled to live dignified, healthy, and productive lives in peace and security, and that the current downward spiral is reversed. I assume you're here tonight because you're interested in the question of Israel and Palestine, and because you are, you probably would have been paying attention to the shootings that went on at the Gaza frontier, um, beginning in the end of March, and still continuing to some degree today. And it's culminated in the middle of May with the shooting of over 60 uh, demonstrators. I think to date, the most recent figure that I've seen by the United Nations is that 254 Palestinians were killed by live gunfire coming from the Israeli army at the Gaza frontier. And somewhere in the range of 23,000 Gazans were injured, and injured either from uh, as small as inhalation of tear gas and needing emergency treatment, all the way to having being shot by live ammunition and losing limbs. <laughs> the, the thing that this winds up exemplifying, besides, I think, triggering a UN, special UN commission of inquiry into the Gaza shootings, which is due to report in March uh, of this year to the uh, General Assembly, is it also illustrates what, how the Gaza health system is on the verge of collapse. You imagine how, uh, how full the Toronto hospitals were in handling the dead and the wounded from the shootings on Danforth Avenue uh, um, or the shootings that were on Young Street uh, in uh, last, last spring and summer. Um, imagine having 60 dead and thousands wounded coming to your hospitals. Hospitals which where 40% of your essential basket of uh, essential medicines and goods uh, were gone. You're absolutely run out of them because you can't you, you can't uh, import them through Israel. Another 40% were less than 30 days supply. You, you pay your nurses and your doctors something like one quarter or one third of their already meager salary um, to wind up working for you. You wind up having doctors, if they can leave Gaza, leaving Gaza because they can wind up earning better livings 
in the Gulf or, or in Egypt. So you have an absolute collapsing medical system uh, when you, uh, at the time when you wind up needing the most because of these mass killings on the, uh, on the Gaza border. So the future of Gaza um, is one I think, you know, I, I can't think of anything but despair when I try to think of where it is going. Um, one can surely point to other hands that have a role in the misery that is in Gaza. Um, the Palestinian Authority um, has uh, withdrawn money uh, from helping to pay for power going into Gaza. Hamas rules Gaza and rules uh, on occasion quite cruelly. Egypt keeps the border crossing at Rafah closed for all but about 10% of the year. Um, uh, but Israel, as I said, I think Israel bears the primary responsibility for these, uh, for these ghastly conditions uh, in Gaza. And as an illustration of what I'm saying, with the lack of power, this was a, I took this off uh, Google, but this is a nighttime satellite photograph of, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. Tel Aviv, with about 500,000, 600,000 inhabitants through there, is an incandescent glow of light in the evening. Gaza, 75 kilometers down the coast, with 2 million people, it can barely be made up, made up with respect to nighttime light. Um, I think in some ways that's all you need to know with respect to how two different societies can li live cheek and jowl next to each other which so which with uh, such uneven outcomes uh, with respect to the primary basis of, uh, of, uh, of life and economy. What I want to talk about now is with respect to settlements and what I see is a, a, an accelerating trend towards uh, annexation. Annexation I want to tell you about with respect to two issues. One is East Jerusalem and one is the, uh, is the West Bank. With respect to East Jerusalem, um, the issue in gray would have been the Israeli um, territory and border um, up till 1967. The area obviously to the north, south, and uh, east of that would be the territory conquered by Israel um, and it includes both the expanded boundaries of East Jerusalem, which uh, is the annexation that occurred in two stages in 1967 and in 1980, in both cases uh, criticized and condemned by the United Nations. And the red we see through there is the root of the, uh, of the, of the separation wall, and it winds up covering uh, not only just West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, but it winds up covering a number of major Palestinian, sorry, Israeli settlements in the West Bank that are adjacent to, uh, uh, to East Jerusalem. Um, in the 1970s, um, the municipality of Jerusalem, together with the Israeli government, said what they wanted to try to do was to ensure that there was a demographic ratio of no less than 70% Israeli Jews and 30% Palestinian Arabs. Um, in, uh, in Jerusalem, in East and West Jerusalem together. Um, and part of their um, process of wanting to ensure that was by building roughly a dozen settlements within the boundaries of East Jerusalem. And today, house somewhere around 210,000 uh, Israeli settlers. Um, notwithstanding that, um, the most recent census tells us that uh, the ratio has actually shifted to about 62% Israeli Jews uh, or Israeli uh, Jerusalemites, uh, Jewish Jerusalemites, and about 38% uh, Palestinian Jerusalemites. So there have been two significant plans that are being suggested um, in which to wind up reversing that demographic trend. One um, is, is not yet uh, consummated, and that's a plan uh, of, of legislation that was introduced into the Israeli Knesset in the fall of 2017. Um, and it's called Jerusalem and Her Daughters Bill. And the purpose of that is to try to expand, annex, if you like, the areas of the West Bank surrounding Jerusalem to the south, north, and east to include five of the largest Israeli settlements um, in order to be able to boost the population of, of Jewish Jerusalem. Um, and the second means is the path of the 
of the separation wall through, through uh, Jerusalem, which has happened, which has wound up excluding roughly 120 to 140,000 Palestinian uh, Jerusalemites on the west bank side of the wall, on the eastern side of the, uh, of the red that you see there. And it's going through two of the, or a couple of the poorest <coughs> neighborhoods, including the Palestinian camp, a refugee camp of Shifat. And it was interesting because the Palestinians who lived in the Palestinian refugee camp of Shufat were refugees from the old city of Jerusalem. Um, they were, uh, they had housed over several hundred years right beside what is known as the Western Wall. Their, their homes were destroyed in the immediate aftermath of the June 1967 war. And they were moved to the Shufat camp, which has now become a fairly large uh, camp and urban center. They are on the both side of the, uh, of the wall, and they receive no services from the Jerusalem municipality. They receive no garbage collection, they receive no uh, sewage collection, um, they receive none of the standard range of, uh, including police services, um, and they receive no services coming from the Palestinian Authority, because that's not, technically speaking, within the Palestinian Authority's jurisdiction. So these towns remain slums, um, uh, where there is a fair amount of crime, there is virtually no economic opportunities there. Uh, if, if the uh, uh, residents of Shufat and these other excluded towns, some of them do have permits to be able to go into Jerusalem to be able to work, but these are festing places of both poverty, misery, and as I said, sometimes crime as well. So, I want to talk a little bit about international law. I don't want to make this into a, a legal lecture. But I do want to say that the importance of looking this through international law, because this is the area where Israel says it does not apply. And this is usually what you find by a country or an individual whom is accused of breaking either domestic law or international law, is that the law does not, law does not mind applying to me. Why is international law so important? For a couple of reasons. I think after the human spirit itself, after those who generally quest for peace with justice, uh, uh, both among Israelis and Palestinians, international law is the most important component to trying to find a just solution to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, struggle and conflict. Why is it so important to be talking about, and I, you see the terms at the top, the international human rights law, international humanitarian law. International human rights law, self-explanatory, are those principles which embed every single one of us by the mere fact of us being human beings with inalienable rights to religion and freedom from discrimination, to freedom of belief, freedom of association, um, the right to self-determination, and so on. International humanitarian law, it is essentially that area of law, of the, of the laws of war, which govern the protections of those populations under occupation. Um, so the United Nations have been very clear over the last 50 years that international humanitarian law, embodied in the fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, applies in full to Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territory. So why um, is international law so important? First of all, it's, as I say, it's not only the most enduring of international conflicts, it's also the most international of conflicts as well. It was the United Nations that partitioned Mandate Palestine in 1947. It was the United Nations that set up the UNRWA, um, the United Nations agency to look after the Palestinian refugees following the 1947-49 war and to give them recompense. Um, there is no conflict in the world that, that, require, that has such attention to the, uh, uh, of the United Nations with respect to diplomacy as the Israel-Palestine conflict. And that's because there's probably no conflict in the world to which the international responsibility is so great. But the other reason why I emphasize international law is that it's the common secular bond for all of us. The international rule of law is the creation of humans, and particularly in the period of time after the Second World War, trying to remember all of the awful lessons that led to the Second World War, that led to the Holocaust, that led to the roughly 60 to 70 million people who died in those six years. A body of international law was created by a set of visionaries and dreamers 
in the five or ten years after the end of, 19, of the war in 1945 to try to create harmonious methods of settling international disputes. Uh, and international law speaks loudly on the issue of Palestine. But there's a paradox there. Um, there's never been a conflict in the world which has generated so much, so many resolutions, so many articles and books, so much commentary and diplomatic oxygen as the Israel-Palestinian conflict on this particular issue. Um, and has advanced our understanding of the laws of occupation, the laws of war, uh, the meaning of, of human rights, international humanitarian law, and so on. The other side of that paradox is, is that the people, the Palestinians, or the peoples of, of Israel and Palestine, have seen precious little of the protection of international law. And it's all that where we put so much energy into drafting international law to try to govern and to regulate and to bring to an end Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So little of that has wound up reaching uh, the Israelis, particularly the Palestinians, uh, in this. What it means in the end, a friend of mine, uh, Professor Victor Kenton, who teaches international law in Singapore, <coughs> said that in the Middle East, international law is closer to power than it is to justice. It's not how it should be, but that, how, that is how it is, is that Israel has steadily wanted to sideline international law from governing any of the key aspects of the conflict. The United States and the Europeans have by and large let that happen, and the Palestinians are far too weak to be able to insist upon international law to, to wind up governing uh, the conflict. So under occupation, and this is a, this is a brief 10-minute lesson on international humanitarian law, Israel has occupied the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and it formally evacuated Gaza in 2005. But Israel, under the laws of, uh, of occupation, continues to effectively control Gaza because it controls who enters, who leaves, what enters, and what leaves. So the world body continues to view Gaza as being occupied, albeit more remotely. Occupation is governed by the 14th Geneva Convention of 1949, which means the Palestinians are protected people under international law. The occupation is meant to be temporary. Stop and think of it. When you think of the major occupations in the world after, the, after 1945, how long was, were the Western powers in Germany for? Roughly 10 years. How long was the United States occupying Japan for after 1945? Again, roughly 10 years. Shh. You, you can ask a question later. Uh, and how long was, um, was the United States uh, or the American-led coalition in Iraq under occupation? Again, roughly 10 years. This occupation is over 50 years. The drafters of the Fort Geneva Convention meant for occupation to be short, to be temporary. Um, and, for, uh, and in other words, the <coughs> occupying power had to leave as soon as reasonably possible. And it was going to stay for a protracted period of time. The justification on it would rise higher and higher as for the reasons why it's there. Temporation, occupation should be temporary. The occupier gains absolutely no rights to territory. There is not an iota of a claim of sovereignty or annexation belonging to an occupying power. Uh, collective punishment is prohibited, as I said, and civilian settlements by the occupying power are, uh, are prohibited. And you can see this expressed in the latest resolution that was passed at the very end of the Obama regime by the Security Council of the United Nations in December 2016, Resolution 2. That's wrong, actually, it should be 2334. Um, reaffirming the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by, by force. That's the no annexation principle. Settlements constitute a flagrant violation under international law. And this is the embodiment of the international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Um, the four core tenements tenets of occupation. First, I'll, I'm now going into a little more detail on these. The occupation is inherently temporary, and the occupier must aim to return territory to the sovereign, which are the people, within a reasonable period of time. An occupation cannot be uh, permanent or even, in, uh, or even indefinite. Um, <coughs> by any standards of how you measure a length of occupation, the prolonged occupation of the Palestinian territories, is in violation of this core tenet.
The second, as I said, is that the occupying power require, acquires no right or title. It cannot annex a single square inch of the territory that it's, uh, that it's occupying. And you see that um, affirmation by Resolution 2334 and this guiding principles here from 1970, no territorial acquisition resulting from the threat or use of force shall be recognized as, as legal. Israel has formally annexed East Jerusalem, contrary to international law and to express UN uh, resolutions, and it is in the process de facto annexing the uh, much of the West Bank. You're in front past one, yeah. So the third principle is that during the occupation, the occupier is to rule as a trustee uh, for the protected people. In other words, it's got to rule them in good faith, it cannot pillage, it cannot change the laws, it cannot change the demography through civilian settlements. Um, and, uh, and therefore it can't use, uh, it can't expropriate water or, or quarries or international um, or national, natural resources for its own good unless it's to keep the army um, that's, that's still doing the occupation. And the fourth point, that the occupying power must govern the uh, occupation in good faith, which means among other things, is that it has to wind up following the, the dictates, the direction of the international community. The international community, every year, through a series of human resolutions, by overwhelming majorities, around 155 votes in favor, to about six or seven or eight votes against, with about 15 abstentions, and some countries that don't vote, overwhelmingly has said each year, the occupation must end, the settlements must be removed, and um, Palestinian states should be formed in East Jerusalem, Gaza, and the West Bank. And these are also reiterated in a series of resolutions coming from the General, from the Security Council uh, as well. Israel is in defiance of probably about 40 resolutions coming from the Security Council, several hundred resolutions coming from the General Assembly, um, several hundred resolutions coming from the uh, Human Rights Council, and also of uh, dictates coming from the Advisory Committee in 2004 from the, from the International Court of Justice. The law that Israel chooses not to obey is astoundingly high in these areas. So the question becomes, if an occupation lasts indefinitely, beyond a reasonable time to end it, in violation of any one of these tenets, let alone all four of these tenets, what is the legal status of the occupation? And in my report in October 2017, I came to the conclusion that Israel has become the illegal occupant of, uh, of, the, of uh, the Palestinian territories. And the UN, I'm asking the United Nations General Assembly to begin to make an investigation into this with respect to the facts <coughs> and international law and determine itself whether or not Israel has become uh, the illegal occupier of, uh, of this. As I said, we have no other standard to be able to judge this by because no occupying power has stayed in occupation for so long. You remember how swift the international community was with respect to Russia when it invaded Crimea in the spring of 2014, almost five years ago. Sanctions were placed against, um, the United, against Russia for its invasion, um, and those sanctions still are in place today. It, still, it became excluded from the G8, now, now the G7 once again. There are a range of consequences for, it, for, um, for Russia's uh, occupation with respect to that. And Israel winds up having roughly a, a cost-free occupation in these circumstances. Is that it? Yes. Last comment. A couple of um, a couple of days after Resolution Two Three Three Four passed the Security Council in, um, in December two thousand sixteen, John Kerry gave, uh, stood up and gave a speech of well over an hour devoted to one topic. It was the last major speech he gave as Secretary, as a U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, and it was a long analysis with respect to the um, ongoing Israeli occupation. He used the term permanent occupation, indefinite occupation, endless occupation, or through his term. Through. And I've always liked that last term, that last uh, phrase that he wound up using. Uh, and I'll just read this to you. How would Israel respond to a growing civil rights movement from Palestinians demanding a right to vote, or widespread protests or unrest across the West Bank. How does Israel reconcile a permanent occupation with its democratic ideals? 